that I worship you Wonderful Savior, I worship you Lord Jesus, I worship you Oh, I worship you I worship you Lord, I worship you Lord Jesus Master, Savior, God, Creator I worship you Now worship you Yes, I worship you I worship you, wonderful God and Lord, I worship you, and I adore, I worship you, Lord Jesus, name above every name, all power and authority given to you. Lord Jesus Christ, my King. You know, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and no. Jesus, 
Christ Jesus, worthy is the Lamb, oh forever, oh worthy is the Lamb, Christ Jesus, worthy is the Lamb, oh he's a King of kings, he's a Lord of lords, he's a Lord The lover of my soul, wonderful Savior, God sovereign, Almighty Supreme, lover of my soul. You're the lover of my soul You're the lover of my soul Jesus, you're the lover of my soul When this seems my soul Oh, this sings my soul. Oh, and forever we'll sing. Oh, this sings my soul. Oh, this sings my soul. Oh, you are ever faithful. And you are always sure. A help to the helpless.
you. For you have redeemed us out of every tribe and tongue. We worship. We worship you. For there is no greater love than yours, God. Oh, there is no greater love than yours, God. Unmeasurable, containable, God kind of love. This living kind of love that grows deeper each day. Oh, faithful, faithful Lord. Welcome everyone this morning. You know, it's so amazing to think about the great things he's done, how he rescued our life from destruction. Oh, how he said, but through the psalmist, he said, our feet upon a rock, the rock Christ Jesus, a sure foundation. Oh, it's great things because it's his life that he poured out for us to give us the life of Jesus Christ so we could have life, a new life abundant, the good times, the great times of God where it's just joy and peace and righteousness and goodness and godliness. And it's just so amazing what he did for us. You know, the Bible says, greater love have no man that he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus was our ultimate friend because he laid down his life. He laid down his life for many, but may it become personal that he laid down his life for you to set us free. I know there's many of you here in this morning. Uh, this may be your first time. Welcome. There may be many of you that have been here many times. You're always still welcome. We love you guys. 
But it's just as the uh, old hymn goes, I think it's a hymn or a gospel song. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Oh, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Has he set you free this morning? Has he given you joy where there was mourning? Giving you peace where there was chaos. Ah, hallelujah. I'm going to invite my lovely wife, Allie, to come up here and minister to you this morning. It's a blessing to be here with you guys in the abiding place. Pastor Mark is still in Aberdeen. I was with him for the past couple days. God's doing great things. Great things. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing to see People genuinely set free, you know, it, it's just, it's just amazing where people encounter the God kind of life where it just, it stirs something on the inside that where you become aware of the Father's love for us, where you become aware of just how personal and just how deep that it's a, it's a divine love and only divine can express it because it just overwhelms every part of your soul. So it's beautiful to see people experience that and to actually come to know something that was just more than, you know, religion, just knowing about a story that, oh yeah, way back a couple thousand years ago, Jesus Christ died on, on Calvary, but experiencing the love that he actually poured out and gave so that we could have. It's a living kind of love. Isn't that amazing? It's a living kind of love. God is love right? And God is the definition of everything that is life, which is the opposite of everything that is sin and death. So it's amazing that we live in a living kind of love, a love that, and what do I mean what you say, Joshua, what do you mean by a living kind of love? I mean, it's a love that grows, you know, just like my, my love for my wife grows and grows more. It's way more than when I first got married over seven years ago to her, but it, it's, it's a love that it gets deeper, it cultivates, and you, you see, you can look at people that have had real genuine love in their relationships, and they're old, and they really love people, especially, and even more so, the, the people that are, you know, they're, they're, God is the center of it, they're, they're, they're in Christ, and they know how to love with the, the God kind of love, but just let me remind you that it's a living kind of love, it's an extravagant love that's just so passionate, it's so amazing, how, how passionate and a loving God we serve. It's just, it's just amazing when, I, when we, you've heard me say this before, but when we step over and actually see who God is, that he defines the most lively, jolly, joyous, exuberant person that there ever was. And he calls us to live in that. He calls us to live in goodness. You know, you see it from the, all the way through. Keep my statutes in command. You're going to have the blessing, the blessing of the Lord. It will be upon you. It's going to be keeping you. It's going to be a keeping power. Just keep my statutes. Keep my precepts. Just do these things. The living kind of love. I thank you, Father, for touching every heart that's in this place. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're free to move and have free course. And you touch the deepest parts of every being an individual. I command spirits to be made alive. I command spirits to awaken. In Jesus' name, to the knowledge of Christ. But not only to the knowledge, but to the living kind of love that's poured in. Hallelujah. Give a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Well, you can be seated, church. So excited to be with you. It's hot. You guys make it hotter when we worship. <laughs> It's not as hot as Crusades in Africa, though, so we'll all be okay, I promise. <laughs> oh, man. Wow, God is good, huh? Yeah. All the time. I love showing up to church, not just to show up to church, but to receive something. And I pray that all of you came with an expecting heart today, that you don't walk out of this place the way you walked into this place, because God wants to meet with you. A living and present God wants to meet and touch every single need you have in your life. So anything that's hindering you right now, anything that is distracting your mind, let it go. We always say, leave that at the door. And come in full to receive from the living God that wants to pour out all things abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine. Ephesians 3.20 is so powerful when we hook up with that and believe it, when we truly believe it. And we're going to talk about it today, but we're really going to talk about the book of Ephesians. And I love the book of Ephesians. Anyone else? 
It's like the Rolls Royce of the epistles for me. There's something so powerful in that and such a strong message of Paul. And the little background for those that haven't maybe read Ephesians, and no worries if you don't have a Bible. I'm going to read the scripture straight from here. But if you do have a Bible, we are going to be in Ephesians 1. But Ephesians was written when Paul was imprisoned. So Paul's in prison, but he's in Rome, but he's writing to the church of Ephesus. And we're really going to study the, the prayer of Paul. I love the prayers of the Bible. Anyone else? I know last time I was preaching a couple weeks back, we talked about John 17, which is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. But the, the prayer here in Ephesians is so powerful about spiritual wisdom. And so it opens up, chapter 1 opens up about the provision for our redemption, which is what? Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. That's the provision that we have. Um, 1 Peter 1.18. So don't lose Ephesians, but let's jump to 1 Peter 1.18 to 19 to open this up today. Love, love, love the scripture. Marlene does too. Amen. <laughs> it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Guys, Christ voluntarily took our place. He stood charge of our sins and paid the penalty with his blood. There's not one other religion I can name that can say that. Is there any other religion you know out there where someone took the place for us by his blood? He was our redeemer. You guys, that's powerful stuff. That's something that, you know, <laughs> makes me kind of like stand here frozen. He has stood in the place. And the most amazing things is not only that, but the fruits of the redemption. And that's when we're going to jump in here in Ephesians 1.7. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I probably say that word way too many times. I love all the scriptures. It's good news, right? The Bible is good news. Praise God. That's why it's still the bestseller, 2,000 years and counting, right? Haven't even changed the editions. Can't say that about nursing school. They change editions about every semester, right, Dr. Stewart? <laughs> All right, Ephesians 1, verse 7. It says, in whom we possess redemption through his blood, the release from trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Amen. Even the forgiveness of sins is the result of this redeeming love according to the riches of his grace. Man, I love the scripture that says he forgives us. He removes our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. He, he puts them in the sea of forgetfulness to remember no more. It kills me when I meet people and they're still stuck in their sin because they don't feel forgiven. They don't feel like the things that they did 25 years ago that the Lord released them. And it's not true. In the scriptures, he tells us, as far as the east is from the west, so are our transgressions are from us. My mom's a th psychologist, and she, <laughs> you know, she has a, um, an amazing group of stories kind of from her 17 years of private practice. But basically, she would say people come with a U-hole U-haul worth of their problems, everything they've ever been through, all the bitterness, all the the hurt, all the unforgiveness, they carry this U-Haul around with them wherever you go. And I don't know, does anyone here like baggage? No. I, I'm like, cut that U-Haul off in Jesus' name. God does not remember those things. Why do you? Why do you remember the transgressions of your friends, the hurt, the unforgiveness? There's so much, so many things like cancer and, and sickness that comes out of people being unforgiven. Let it go. I mean, there's this, this saying, which isn't scripture at all, but it says, you waiting for someone else to ask forgiveness is like you drinking the poison, hoping that they're going to die. Guys, God forgives us as much as we forgive others. So we need to realize, hey, I'm not running with a U-Haul, baby. I'm not even a fast runner, but I know I can't run with a U-Haul. And I know I don't want extra baggage in my life that's not going to be glorifying to God and hurt, unforgiveness, all that thing. God wants to cut that off. Why? Because he doesn't remember our sins. Once we ask forgiveness, it is gone. It is in that sea of forgetfulness. It is the transgressions as far as the east from the west. You can't see the east is from the west, right? So put those things behind you. I love this. It says God's ways are full of everything that the heart of man desires. In him alone is love, joy, and peace that all men seek. In his presence is fullness of joy and the pleasures that only God, knowing God's life, can bring. Guys, the Holy Spirit desires us to show us what we are created to be. All we must do is respond to his love. It is God's word, Christ Jesus, 
It is in God's word, Christ Jesus, that we find the knowledge of who we really are and the glory of pure and holy living that is not blemished. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Pastor Geneva. <laughs> um, you know, it's pretty radical when Paul is in prison praying for the church because a way to solve problems and to bring change to our church and our community is through the activity of prayer. Paul saw the need for the saints of the church of Ephesus to be more fully understood what they have been given in Christ. Therefore, to see that need met, he began to pray for them. We observe that even in the life of Jesus, Paul placed the activity of praying for people right, out, right alongside of preaching to the word to them. That's why we have prayer an hour before the church begins, right? Pastor wants to set a precedence in our life that we are praying. We're praying for each other. We're praying for the church. We're praying for our community. We're praying for our nation because that's just equal alongside of me now preaching the word to us. Prayer is so radical, and we're going to talk about that a little more, but the disciples of Jesus saw what happened when Jesus prayed and were earnest to move more into that. Turn with me real quick to Luke 11, 1, but keep your finger on Ephesus. <laughs> Maybe I should buy you all bookmarks because I usually always say that. I'm all over the place. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 11, 1, another amazing chapter. This was the model prayer. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray as John also taught his disciples. One of the most important aspects of prayer is believing that those things you will ask will be done. Amen. Amen, amen. The power of faith must be surging through the prayers that we pray if we're going to see the power of God revealed. Come on, baby. <laughs> God has ordained that we have the kind of relationship with him that results in receiving whatever we ask. One of my all-time favorite scriptures is John 15, 16. It's one of the first scriptures I ever memorized when I gave my life to the Lord at 24. So turn with me there if you don't know it by heart. And put this on your mirror. Remember I talked about the dry erase markers if you're trying to get these things into your heart or on your little note cards and put them up on your uh, little visor every stoplight. Just get the word in your heart, man. It's the shield, man. It helps you get through every single thing of your day. It's the blueprint of our lives to be living. The word of God, oh, it's powerful. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me. He didn't, didn't choose you, right? Right? But I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. All right, get ready. Hold your, seat, hold your seats. <laughs> that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Guys, this is so radical. This is so radical, but we must be persistent in believing and continue to ask until everything he has purposed in our lives and for our lives and those of the church takes place. I remember a powerful story. I think Tyler's working today. I don't see him. Um, but remember when we were doing prayer and fasting every Saturday as a church? Pastor had us a season going through that. And during that season, our little one pound of miracle was in Rady Children's ICU. And we were four months in at this point, and we were getting so close to Anna being discharged. We were probably about a week out, and you were all here praying and fasting. And Joshua and I were sitting at the bedside, and I opened up her diaper, and she started bleeding out everywhere. And I just said, no, in Jesus' name, we are about to go home. We've had enough of this. I can't, no, 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 no. And then her heart rate dropped, and then her blood pressure plummeted, and then they called a code. 
meaning that this, this baby's going to die. So everyone comes rushing in. And it was just so overwhelming. I felt like Joshua and I had gotten to a place of fighting for this girl's life for 97 days. And we were finally getting out. We were breaking free of this place. I couldn't wait to sprint out the doors. My sister Elizabeth was there with the cameras to videotape and document it. And I just cried out. I'm like, this can't be happening. This is not right. This is, we, are, we are ready to be discharged. And so they rush her back into the you know, more intensive part. And all the doctors are there. And they push us away and tell us to get out of the room. And, and I'm calling pastor. I'm calling pastor. And I know he's here praying and fasting with you guys. So he's not answering my call. And then I called Tyler, <laughs> and he answered the call, and I said, bring your phone to Pastor right now. And so he ran up here, and he gave the phone to Pastor. He said, what's up? I, and, I, and I told him, you know, what's going on? He says, listen, listen, I told you this morning something. What did I tell you? Everything's going to be fine. I didn't read it in New York Times. I know that by faith. I know whatever we ask the Father that we believe and we shall have it. Amen. Amen. And praise God, I'm blessed that I married into the family. Absolutely. <laughs> but I wasn't raised in a church like this. There's still things my husband's working out in me. He's like, babe, you've kind of had wrong models there. This is how we act. I'm like, okay, right, right, in faith, in faith. No fear, faith, walking in faith. But I got off the phone with Pastor, and it was just like faith arose in me, just like this says, like having the power surging in you, believing. It says the power of faith must be surging through our prayers, that if we, ple if we pray that we are going to see the power of God revealed. Guys, that power came up in me that all those docs and everyone there, I was like, get away, get away, in Jesus' name, right now, right now, everything goes right, everything, everything goes right. And I got hands on her, and her blood pressure went back up. Her heart rate went back up. And they were like, what is going on? <laughs> they could not testify enough to the miracles that we saw. And there's so many more miracles. And most of you know all the miracles because Pastor documented every single one for the 105 days and pretty much shared with you guys every church meeting um, during that time of our season. But I remember that being so pivotal in me. That Pastor had spoke earlier that day, and it was, you know, not un 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 like. It wasn't normal that he would just text me on a random Saturday, really, but he knew. He knew I was going to need something. No, but Jesus knew. Jesus knew something had to be deposited in my faith because he knew what was going to go down. But we knew that everything was going to be okay. And, whew, I got fired up. Woo! <laughs> you think it's hot out there? It's getting a little hot around here. <laughs> Thanks, babe. I love that guy. <laughs> He actually said, babe, I can, I, I'll do the meeting. Don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm like, no, I need to increase in this. I need to increase in the gift of faith. And Brittany, thank you for your text this morning and praying for me. Like, I just want to grow deeper in the anointing. I want to be able to get up here and just be full of the Holy Spirit and just be flowing in him in a greater dimension. So I did give him tonight's meeting, though. <laughs> he said, 50-50, babe, you take tonight. Um, <laughs> All right, so, well, here's my prayer. No wonder I want to read Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 23 with you guys. So turn back to Ephesians 1. We're going to hear Paul's prayer. Um, just think of Paul praying this out in the prison in Rome. He wants every one of us who are believers to realize fully our privileges in Christ. You guys there, Ephesians 1, 15. Yep, yep. All right, he says, therefore, I love that word, why? Because I'm like, what is it there for? <laughs> that went over a few people. So what is it there for? <laughs> therefore, thanks, Matos. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Guys, that's radical. Give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Guys, he wants the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened, that we might behold the glory of Christ. How many of you guys know there's not really a good use of showing a blind person a sunset? 
right? Talking about how gorgeous it is. Well, the same is true. There is no way for us to even begin to comprehend what God has done through Jesus Christ without giving us divine insight. Amen? It's totally, totally above man's intellect, right? I mean, my dad's amazing, and we were raised Catholic, and he analytically tries to study the Bible and the robes that they wore and all this stuff. And I said, Dad, some of the things we just need divine insight. Some of the things the Lord just works in the Holy Spirit to help us understand. Whoosh. Mind blown, right? Mind blown. But this is the radical thing right here. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, but it's only through this work of grace that we are able to accept these things as a present and live in reality and to function in them. Jesus did great miracles, signs, and wonders by revelation, but how did he do it? He was able to see the Father do it. Now, this is the most mind-blowing in my book right here. Now, the same relationship, the same relationship Jesus and God had with the Father has been granted unto us, unto me, unto Ruth, unto Joshua, unto Kelly. All these things, same relationship, everything that belongs to the Father, he says, has freely been given unto us and is transferred to us by the Holy Spirit. If we are to mature and develop in these things of the Spirit, then we must allow the Holy Spirit to continually fill us and strengthen us. We must be as dedicated to be instructed by him as he is in training us if we are to function in all these spiritual blessings and divine abilities. There's so much training we all go to, right? My husband's on his, like, 15th degree. Well, really third, but he's going all the way. He's been in school for 30 years. (laughs) Pastor Mark, the same, right? Must run in the blood. A lot of us go to get training, a lot of degrees or, you know, certificates or just from kind of workmanships. I don't know if your professors are as hooked up as Jesus is about training you in these types of things than your professors are. But right here it says that we must be dedicated to be instructed because he's dedicated to Brittany and Jacqueline and Clara and Zoe. He's dedicated to us, to the training of this. It's not something that I have to go to Bible college for 32 years. Praise God. I'm already getting old. I want to have time. I'd be like 67 up here trying to preach. But I am so thankful by the Holy Spirit that he instructs and guides me in the ways to go. And that I'm dedicated to giving myself to the word and giving myself to the, to the correction of the Holy Spirit. I love being in this church. Why? I get corrected every day. I mean, I don't know if there's one person that gets more corrected than me, Naomi, and Anna. I'm not too sure, right, guys? Lately, it's kind of been a highlight of the front row. Praise God. I'll take mine now. I'll take mine now. Someone said to me, I feel really bad for you. The pastor's always pointing you out. And I'm like... No, 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 no. Feel bad for me if he didn't, and I meet with Jesus, and Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'll take the now. I'll have my now. So when you are corrected, you guys, when we're corrected in the spirit, don't look at the man. Don't look if it's a pastor or the leadership in the church. Don't look, look past that and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to change? You are committed. Your word says you're dedicated to instructing me. Help me understand that. Help me to be able to receive the more you receive, guys, the more you are just open to correction and understanding, whoosh, your growth goes to here. Anyone experience that? And then, boom, to here. And all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, I got greater wisdom and discernment than I've ever had in my life. How did this happen? Oh, I know when it happened. Right then, when I just, you know. And this is the best thing. God defends us from our enemies. If someone's, you know, going after you and saying all these horrible things and stuff like that, God says, blessed are you that are cursed. You're blessed. You don't have to run your mouth back at them. Just sit back and be like, no worries. All right. And you know that there's a blessing in that. And you also know that God's going to defend you. It's such an empowering thing. Honestly, it's so empowering, especially being a girl, you know, raised by three brothers. (laughs) Very empowering to sit back and be like, all right, no problem. God defends my enemies. I'm good. I'm good. All right, here we go. That hurt. I'm good. I'm good. Now, verse 19, this is probably my favorite verse in this prayer. He says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to us? No, no, no. No, no, no. According to the working of his mighty power. Nothing according to us, but according to his mighty power. All right, this gets me fired up and I'm already sweating. Here we go. (laughs) There is a power that works within us. And this is the fullness of every dimension of God's own power. Ephesians 3.20, it's one of my favorite things. If you follow me on Facebook, I put it in hashtags like a couple times a week at least. 
He wants us to know that he has not withheld any of his power or resources from us, but he has entrusted us with all that he has so we might fulfill his will on earth just as it is in heaven. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Church is not boring to me when I read scriptures like that and I hear about this God divine power living in me. Amen? Amen. Someone tried to tell me that religion is a crutch when I first got saved. And I thought, a crutch? What does that even mean? Yeah, it's for the weak people. It's like, you know, a crutch for them. Like, oh, I got to depend on my religion. I was like, "Uh, yo, have you read the Bible? Have you read about this power that surges out of us, that we do these things, all things abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine, that we have that in that, that the relationship that Jesus had with the Father, I have with him, there's not a crutch there. This is like the most amazing, radical thing I think I've ever read in my life. And they're like looking at you like, Oh, wow, she believes it, and she's, like, really fired up. And, what with a power, what is this power? Is she going to get, what? (laughs) Right? We need to be so filled up in the word when people try to tell us, you know, reading the Bible is a crutch or these types of things that we say, no, it's not a crutch. And what you have need of, all the things that you have need of, God wants to supply you according to his riches in heaven. This is radical stuff. Radical, radical stuff. You can't get that in New York Times. You can't get this stuff off the Internet. This is the word of God that's living and active. All right, I'm almost done, don't worry. (laughs) Verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is the age to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, you, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Guys, that's powerful stuff. That stuff should shake your bones when you wake up in the morning and realize that we have dominion, we have all authority. If you don't understand the authority, I highly recommend to get the Authority of Christ book that Pastor wrote. It's basically all scripture. But man, there's powerful things in that, knowing the authority we have in Christ Jesus. That authority, Joshua came in and spoke faith into a desperate situation, March 29th, 2011, when they said, it's a wash. There's nothing we can do for your wife and your child's not going to make it either. That faith he had built up in his bone, that power surged in him to say, no, that's not what the word of God says. I'm going to hook up with that faith and we're going to see a great miracle. Amen. But you can't get that faith when you walk in the ER with your wife on her deathbed. It doesn't all of a sudden come to you. You're like, babe, everything's fine. He practices that day in and day out. He gives himself to the word. He gives himself to a full diet of increasing every single day in that faith. And we're going to have to have some faith like that, guys, because I don't know if you checked the elections, but that's a tad scary. Anyone? I don't know if anyone has great peace in their heart, but the signs of the times are on the walls. There's crazy things happening. I mean, you can watch the news, which I don't do. If you watch the news, you better have faith to watch the news. Amen? It's pretty scary what's happening just outside of our doors. But we have all authority. We have all authority. It says we have dominion over these things. Fear should not hinder our lives anymore. If we're walking into things and we're like, oh, Lord Jesus. No, not again. I can't do this. Instead of be like, Father, I will not be in this place again. I command a blessing upon my house. I command the finances to come in. I command wholeness in my body. If we command these things and we walk in the authority, we're going to walk it out. If we have problems with our kids, clearly I'm having a learning of discipline and helping a toddler know that her will is <laughs> going to come into submission to mommy and daddy and what we say, and she's not going to run the church meetings, right? However, I have to get on my knees and pray because I'm kind of a pushover. And I'm kind of like, oh, you're so cute. You're okay. No problem. Yeah, see, look at her. She's like, oh, so cute. It's all right. Um, but we need to really increase in that and have the authority. And I'm learning that. Anyone else? Amen. Let's give ourselves to understanding what that authority looks like. Now, that power that has been invested in us is the same power that Christ Jesus now possesses. The power is so immense and the work of grace so great that we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation to begin to understand it. Going back to, it's, it's greater than the mind. I don't care how many degrees you have and how smart you are. We have a lot of degrees and a lot of smart people in this church, right? But it, it, God's no respecter of man. Praise God for the PhD, but who cares if you finished high school? 
God's no respecter. He says that this power is so immense that we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation, not PhDs, not, you know, 50 years of Bible school, but the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Guess what? He gives that to all of us. It is freely pulled out to all of us. This power was given when God raised Jesus from the dead. He set him on his own right hand and poured out the Holy Ghost upon us. We cannot imagine for ourselves... Listen up, church, this is important. If you don't remember a thing I said today, (laughs) remember this. We cannot imagine for ourselves some small positions that we have earned into the framework of this divine authority, but that which has been fully vested in Christ Jesus. We have nothing other than what Jesus has. There are no various degrees of favor, Pastor Ruth doesn't get more than Pastor Cade. There's, there's no degree of difference. Pastor Mark doesn't get more. He says there, there's no favor or structure of hierarchical positions around Christ Jesus. We are seated together with him, and there are no other positions available. Guys, that is amazing. He is no respecter of man. You can read this. It's straight out of the Ephesians commentary upstairs that Pastor Mark wrote. I read that the other day, and I was like, come on. Come on. Sometimes I'm like, oh, like me. Like, oh, yeah, Joshua, you can preach. That's great. I don't, you know. No. God's no respecter of persons. I have to give myself to this. I have to give myself to prayer. I have to give myself to the discipline of studying the word. Some of the stuff I was writing, he said, where'd you get that? I'm like, oh, I've been studying all these commentaries. He's like, who wrote the commentaries? I'm like, all right, brother, I'll I'll go back. (laughs) We'll stick to dates, Pastor Mark. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there, I'm sure, if you start researching on the Internet. But um, anyway, I'll keep going. The power of Christ Jesus is superior to every imaginal hostile power. There are principalities, powers, and dominions that exist in the heavenly or spiritual realm, but all of them, not some of them, not some of your cancers, not some of your tumors, not some of your heartaches, not some, all of them. Say that with me. All of them. All of them are subject to Christ Jesus. They are also subject to us. Us. Because we are seated together with Christ Jesus in this heavenly realm and vested with his authority. I can just imagine Paul sitting in this jail cell, having this vision of the Holy of Holies, like writing this to the church of Ephesus, wake up, wake up. Do you understand the authority that you have? Do you I'm sorry if I woke some of you up with that. I get very, very excited in all things in my life. It's especially preaching, especially when I read about the power and the authority that we are given by Christ Jesus alone. Amen. But he says the power and authority of Christ Jesus has no limits. No limits. It's not limited just to a $1,000 mortgage. It's not limited to the $10 million mortgage. If you have that $10 million mortgage, praise Jesus. Maybe we should build some more churches. <laughs> but it extends to all situations, everywhere, and for all the time. Guys, that has to be a living reality in us. It can't just be that, you know, certain people get miracles and certain people get breakthroughs. It's not. I promise you, I know every single one of you in this church has a need. You have a great need for the Lord to fulfill. And you know what? It might be a pending divorce. It might be cancer. It might be you're broke, eating ramen. We were there. We're still alive. You might have a great need. But God wants to supply that read according to his riches. According, that's why I love the Ephesians 3, 3.20. He's going to supply all of our needs abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine. The church is to function in all fullness of the God's power and glory. There's a hundreds, hundreds of scriptures devoted to the divine order that we are to function in. However, if we don't comply with God's demands, then the glory of the church and the person of Jesus Christ will not be revealed. I love when Paul, he doesn't care how much scripture you know. He's like, where's your power? Where's the demonstration of power? I love when Pastor is like, Where your, where's your fruits? You want to serve in ministry? Show me your fruits. That puts a little fire under your bum, huh? You can't walk up and say, oh, I'm ministering to these people and I'm mentoring these people, but you have no fruits in your life. You can't even make it to church. You're not getting souls saved. I mean, you got to check yourself at the door and praise God, I got a baby sister that does that to me weekly. I love you. (laughs) He says, Jesus established the leadership and authority in the church so that his people, that's us guys, that we could be trained up in all his ways and learn to function in this unspeakable gift. Is there anyone here that does not want this gift today? Praise God. 
<laughs> Praise God, we got smart people here. The church began when about 120 people gathered together to wait on what? The Holy Spirit. They wait in that upper room on that day for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out, that is when the church was born. I remember the first time I read Acts, I'm like, I have never seen a church like this a day in my life. What does this even look like? And then I met you all. And I came to the abiding place about 10 years ago. And I thought, and I told Pastor Mark, you guys are like the Acts church. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's what all churches are supposed to look like. That is the only model for a church that was ever set forth, and its birth was in the book of Acts. <sighs> Mind blown. It is essential that we give the Holy Spirit its proper place and understand that we cannot be witnesses of Jesus without his work. The Holy Spirit must be allowed to take over our meetings, as he did in that first church meeting, if the church is to function as we have ordained it. I am so thankful we come in here and it's not the same thing every single week. That we don't go in, come out, same thing. All my friends, when they come, okay, so 10.30 is the same as 6? Absolutely not. What do you mean? Two church service, same day, different message? Absolutely. And I have no idea what it's going to be. Why? Because we flow in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people have problems with my husband's music. No joke. This is what they tell me. He sings the same words like over and over. It just like sometimes goes so long I feel like I'm singing the same thing for 20 minutes. I said, well, that's powerful because you're not really singing it. You're to be praising God and he's to be, you know, the only thing that you're worshiping. It's not for man. We don't have a production studio. We don't have crazy lights, although they're hot. Um, <laughs> we don't have, you know, these amazing amenities is for us. We don't powder your pew. I'm sorry. It's, it might not be a comfy chair. Why? Because we're not here for us, guys. We need to move into we're here for God. We're here for a living God that wants to meet with us. We're here to praise him. We're here to move and function all power and authority that he has for us. And I praise God for this church. You know, we were in Santa Cruz for three years. We flew down faithfully every month almost for three years, but I couldn't wait till we moved back to be a part of this because guess what? There is no church I've ever been been into that moves in this power and authority where you see all these miracles happen week after week. I mean, so radical, my volleyball teammate that came that had that gnarly car accident and she could hardly walk and she was here um, refereeing for the AVP and she says, I need to come to your church because I know I'll be healed. Will you pick me up? I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, no problem. And so I was so thankful she already had that faith in her because she's already been to the doctor. She already had her MRI. She already had the pain pills. She already had all that. She's like, I need a touch from Jesus. And I don't, your church is radical. I, I just know. I just know you guys do radical things, and I'm at that point. So she walked in here with such a faith to be healed that, boom, pastor laid hands on her, and we went to lunch afterwards, and she pulled out her Vicodin, and she's like, whoa, whoa. And she starts moving around. She's like, I don't have any pain. Wait. She like gets up. I mean, she was freaked out of her mind. She was like, I, I, I don't have pain. I don't have, call your dad. Call your dad. I don't have pain anymore. I've been completely healed. So radical, right? I love that. I love that. All right, we're finishing here. So only the Holy Spirit can reveal Jesus. And if he is not given full control, then what God has ordained cannot function. That would be a sad day, especially in the abiding place. But just as the body is dead without the Spirit, the church is death without the Holy Spirit. I am so thank thankful that the Holy Sp Spirit can rule and reign in this place. And I am so thankful that our worship is to him and not to man. So church, let us lift, lift up our prayer life. Let's raise the bar here today. Let's raise our bar in praying for each other, for our church, for our nation. The power of prayer has a transformation, transforming and transfiguring effect. We've seen that, right? Has anyone seen the power of prayer have a transforming and transfiguring effect? If you didn't, I'm going to pray for you today, and we are going to see a transforming and transfiguring effect on your life. He says, we are commanded to cooperate with God through prayer and to take up the dimension of his mighty power, continuing with all prayer and supplication and the Holy Ghost. 
Guys, that is radical. God heard Hannah's prayer, Elijah's prayers, Jonah's prayers, and he'll hear your prayers too. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the abiding place. I thank you for every soul in this church, Lord. Father, I thank you for every need that's brought forth, Father, that it will be met with that Ephesians 3.20, abundantly above all we could ever ask and imagine. And, Father, I thank you, Lord, that we would move into a greater dimension as a church, Father, and greater authority and greater power, Father, as we go out to this streets and we do our community reaches outreaches and as we have our community clinic here next Saturday father I thank you Lord that we will see a great demonstration of you the Holy Ghost moving in us father I thank you Lord that we would all raise the bar in our lives father a greater prayer life father that we'd reach a greater anointing that will break every yoke off San Diego off this nation father that we would live in that perfect peace you talk about that we would have that joy unspeakable father we would have such unconditional love that people would say who are you and where do you go to church? That love just abounds out of your pores. And Father, I thank you, Lord, right now. I thank you for blessing Pastor Mark and Pastor Ann as they are ministering the gospel all over the U.S. Father, I thank you that chains are broken off these people, Father, as he brings the Holy Spirit, as these churches return to the church of Acts, Father, that they give you full reign to do what you come and do, Father, and that is that you do great signs, wonders, and miracles. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we increase in sign, wonders, and miracles, Father, that we would be used as a vessel poured out for you, Father, that our lives would be all about you, Father. They wouldn't be our jobs, and they wouldn't be who we are in the society, but Father, that we'd be sold out in a greater dimension to serve you, Father. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Church, let's all stand together. We are so, so blessed. Naomi's ready for prayer. Gnomes, do you need prayer? You can come up for prayer. We are so blessed to be a part of this body together, you guys, and we only function as one whole. And there's needs that need to be met in this church. And we are called, we are called as brothers and sisters in Christ to meet those needs of each other. And the greatest need I think that some of us have is to be fortified in Christ. And we do that by praying for each other. You don't have to give three million bucks out when you come to church, but it would be great to deposit that in prayer for each other, for their lives, for things that are happening. We have so many awesome pregnant mommies. We have new babies coming in. We have exciting things that are happening in the church with ministry all over the world. Let's commit ourselves, guys, to praying for those things. So right now, I just pray that we all just cry out for all the needs that we have in the church, in the nation, and everything we have going on. And I want you, if you need prayer and want to touch heaven with us, Joshua and I would love to pray with you. And Naomi will probably pray with you too. Naomi's the first person to come up to prayer every service. So come up here if we can pray with you. We love to pray with you guys. If you need a big deposit in your bank account, don't forsake your ties. <laughs> There's such a blessing poured out, pressed down, shaken over for all of you guys to be hooked up in that. But keep praying as these people come up. There's needs here, guys. This isn't our time to talk to our friends about the Olympics, although those are, you know, exciting times, of course. But right here, we have great needs for people to be met and that we want to be hooked up with a supply for every single one of them, especially our next generation with Justice and Naomi. Amen. We love you, church. We love you so much. And we have prayer at six, 5, and my um, husband will be preaching at 6 tonight.